Let's read. If you will stand with me, we're going to read these two verses together out loud. We'll read it quite a few times this month. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13 and 14. We will read it together and then we will pray. Sounds like I'm really loud. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 13. We'll do 13 to 14. Let's begin. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you asking that you would meet with us this morning. We need you and we want to hear from you. We have your word, we have ears, but do we have listening ears? And do we have hungry hearts? Lord, the world has got Christians' attention. There are too many people who are missing this morning, too many of us who are worn out, who, um, uh, Lord, our, our minds and our hearts aren't just focused just on Jesus. So this morning, I pray that we set everything aside, we listen to you, and that you help us this morning. Help us with a, a, um, uh, a bondage that Christians are in that need to be freed from so that we can press toward that mark, so that, we, so that we can win that prize. Lord, there is a Christian life to be lived, and we can live it. We need to do it by faith. We need to do it in obedience to your word. So this morning, I pray that you would help us to look at our own lives and see where the devil has tied us back and held us back. Help us to be free. And I pray that there'd be uh, many different uh, understandings this morning of, of just how free we can be, first from sin and from the dominance of sin, but secondly, from our past. And I pray that you would help us to be have listening ears and not dull. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Now, in Philippians, Paul is sitting in prison. He is sitting in probably, you can't comprehend what kind of life it was to be in prison in those days, but Paul was there, and instead of moaning, he is dictating a letter to some of the most precious people in his life. They were Christians over in a town called Philippi. Now, Philippi, now if you get the idea, Paul is in prison in Rome. But about 1,500 miles away in Philippi is a church that he's writing to. And he says, I want to make sure they keep, keep going. I want to make sure they stay faithful, that they press on, that they don't quit. Because it's never been easy to be a Christian. It has always either been persecuted or it has become irrelevant. Throughout history, there's always been something more fancy, something shinier, something brighter than, than what the Bible offers. There's multimedia today. There's, there's, uh, uh, somebody, wants, uh, somebody put up a, a great uh, little meme I saw yesterday. It says, when phones were, were, uh, were, um, had, a, had a wire, people were free. Now that phones have no wires, people are in bondage. And, and we, have, we have been enamored by technology, and so we uh, have an, exchanged our freedom that's in Christ for bondage to this world. And Christians are falling away too fast. So Paul writes to the Philippian Christians, and he tells them some things that are important for them to be able to keep going. He encourages them. And, and the question is, how? How, did, how could you, sitting in prison, I mean, I don't know what kind of food he got, but it definitely, definitely uh, was something he could not write home about. And as he writes them, he can't say life is good. He can't say um, uh, everything's working out fine. He says some of the most unusual things that you would think could be written from prison. Look in Philippians 4, 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, and Paul could talk about all the things that he lacked, 
But he says this, for I have learned, and you ought to circle that word learned, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. So Paul is content where he's at, and he's trying to encourage other Christians, saying, mm, let me encourage you to keep going. And he says, he says, you need to do one thing, just one thing, and we looked at it earlier, and that is to, to not try to do 20 things, just one thing. Strive to do just one thing every day. Uh, I, I can see a lot of people in the modern era are exercising. And I'm glad for it because 25 years ago, nobody exercised. It was a fluke. It was a fad. Everybody else was drinking themselves silly. Now, people are listening up on the drinking and they're doing more in the exercise. They really, every morning, they're up and they're doing that one big thing. And that's a good thing. That's great. But a Christian has a higher calling. We press toward a mark. We press for a, toward a high mark. And uh, that's, a, that's a distant point. If you have ever um, watched runners <clears throat> on, a, on a track or people who set out for a marathon race, they know that there is a finish line, a mark that they must cross. And in their mind's eye, they know they've got to keep pressing toward that mark. Most people can't see what we see. We see a finish line that's not of this, of this life. But uh, you're in Philippians. Go to the left. Find 1 Corinthians. The mark that we have, that we're striving for, we have to keep in sight. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24 says this, No, you're not. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. Supposed to run the whole race. But how many receive the prize? Just one, okay? So run that ye may obtain. Uh, verse 25. And every man that striveth for the master, strive is that pressing, striving to win, is temperate in all things. He doesn't stay up late, doesn't eat. Um, a high carb diet is temperate in all things. Now they do it for a corruptible crown. People who run in the Olympics and normal races, they, they try to win a corruptible crown, but we strive to do it for an incorruptible crown. Now Paul says that there are several smaller things that needed to be done so we could do the one main thing. Do you remember what, uh, what's the main thing? Somebody tell me, what's the main thing? Press toward the mark for the prize. The main thing is to finish. The main thing is to not quit. What do you think Peter's greatest <clears throat> regret in his life was? That he quit. That when Jesus Christ was there in, in uh, uh, Caiaphas' house, and, G and Peter was right outside the door, and when a woman, and then another man, and then another man came up and kept accusing him of being a disciple of Jesus, he kept denying. And Jesus could hear him deny his name. <coughs> and he even heard, G he even heard Peter uh, curse Jesus' name. And there was Peter, the rest of his life, he had one blotch, he had one Regret, and that was, there was a time when Jesus needed me to stay faithful, and I quit. So there's this one big thing, and that is to finish. But there's some smaller things that enable you to do the one big thing. Remember what they were? Forgetting things that are behind you. And secondly, reaching forth for things that are better that are ahead of you. So this morning, I want to talk about the things that are behind us. Our memories, our past. I'd like to make you some good forgetters. Because if you're going to be a good winner, you're going to have to be a good forgetter. And by way of background, not everything needs to be forgotten. <clears throat> you don't need to forget your salvation. Do you remember getting saved? It ought to be kept fresh. You need to sit down every once in a while. You say, I can't remember the day. Well, are you saved is a question. Can you at least say, I know that I know that I believe. I, I, I repented. I knew that there was sin in me. I couldn't remember 
uh, one billionth of them all. I just knew I was lost without hope. I cried out to God, and, and I, just, I just know that he loved me, and he gave himself for me, and I believe, and I, I, I remember my salvation. <clears throat> you know what's wonderful? Even if you do ever forget your salvation, God won't forget you. You can go through dementia, and God says, I've engraved you in the palm of my hand. I cannot forget you. But never forget your salvation. Uh, never forget your, your family. You know, the Bible says, if a man doesn't take care of his family, he's worse than a what? Infidel. You want to take care of yourself. You always want to buy things for you. You always think of doing things for your own benefit and your, happy, uh, your own happiness. Don't forget your family. Don't forget your parents. Parent, uh, teenagers growing up and have no concept of the gift of their home and their family. Don't forget your family. Don't forget the blessings of God. You know, we're constantly being blessed whether you admit it or not. But there's a scary verse in your Bible. Uh, Psalm 917 says this. says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. Don't you dare forget how good God has been in your life. Because the reason why it's hell out there is because they forgot God. And God's been very good to this country. <clears throat> but it's not going to last much longer. Don't forget your victories. The milestones, the memorials of your Christian life, no matter how few victories, and I know how, no matter how many few miracles there are in your life, God gave you your wife, God gave you your children, God called you to serve Him. Don't you forget that. You may struggle with it for the rest of your life, but it was a great victory when God said, I want you. You ever experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit? If you've ever been at a time where you just felt just pure joy, peace, you just wanted to serve God, quit your job, and just live full, flat out, that was the fullness of the Spirit of God. Don't ever forget that. Yearn for it constantly. When was that? Remember when you led somebody to Christ? Never forget that. The greatest thing to have in your life where God used you to birth a, baby new, a new baby Christian. Treasure those memories. Never forget the words of God. You know what Job said there in uh, Job 23, he says, Neither have I gone back from his ways, from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his lips. Sorry, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said, in spite of all of the trouble I've been through, I value his words more than my necessary food. So Psalm 119 over and over says, I would delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. You need to memorize God's word. You say it's getting harder and harder to memorize. Of course it is. Man, I'm trying to work on memorizing and rememorizing scriptures I memorized 25 years ago. But I, 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 I constantly remind myself, I cannot forget this book. I cannot forget God's word. <clears throat> Don't forget them. Never forget where you're headed. You see, there was a time where I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was headed for hell. Now I'm headed for heaven. Never forget that. You say, well, my life doesn't show great heavenly blessings all the time. No, it doesn't have to. But one day, one day it will. One day you'll be walking into heaven. You'll go, man, I don't deserve to be here, but I'm glad to come. Don't never forget where you're headed. Heaven ought to still thrill you. The devil, the devil comes, as I said already this morning, the devil comes along and robs us of our future. He can't change our destination, but most people are not enjoying the ride. Never forget where you're going. Don't you fear death. Don't fear the hospital. Don't fear the grave because it has no more sting. It has no more power over you. When your eyes close in death, they will open in the presence of Jesus. Never forget where you're headed. Never forget your fellow laborers. Don't forget the people who work hard serving the Lord. Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unrighteous to, for, unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. God won't forget people's labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Don't forget that God notices the little things that we do for one another. Don't you forget that there are people who are serving. That's why I wanted to honor them this morning. I've been trying to figure out how to do that for the last several weeks and fit it into the schedule. 
where some people just need to know we appreciate them. Don't forget it. Don't forget. Listen, I sometimes question and I go, what would happen if I didn't show up on Sunday? Some people say, it wouldn't make a difference at all. <laughs> Honestly, it shouldn't. But in the right way. Huh? What if we didn't have church here this morning? What if, what if we lost this? What if we lost one another? Don't, don't forget what it takes so that we have church. Don't forget all of the labor that goes into it. Now, what needs to be forgotten, well, let me just quote this verse for a second. There are so many things that should never be forgotten. Psalm 103, verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. There's so many things that should not be forgotten. <clears throat> but there are some things that definitely need to be forgotten. We're going to look at those things this morning. Now, what needs to be forgotten is often hard to forget, and we feel like this. We just, a blank stare over our, our face. When we read the Bible, it says, forgetting those things which are behind. We just don't we even think about, well, what are the things that are behind? You know what the truth is? We're good at forgetting all the wrong things. Like the age of our kids. <laughs> like their birthdays. Like whether we paid the road tax or not. The Garda will remind you. We forget many of the answers on a school test. test. Everything's great until the teacher says, and by the way, take out your notebooks, there's a test today. All of a sudden the mind goes blank. We forget what our wives ask to see to the shop. Never ask a guy to go to the shop without a list. And make sure the list makes sense too, because... <laughs> The last thing a guy wants to do is ask his wife, what did you mean by such a... He'll just make it up as he goes along. We're good at forgetting the wrong things. But we especially forget the goodness of God. Jeremiah 2 says this, Can a maid forget her ornaments? This is a woman, a young lady. Can she forget her earrings and her... <clears throat> Put on her makeup or a bride. Can she forget her attire? Can you imagine somebody getting married and she opens up the back door of the church and starts to get out and she goes, oh, I forgot to get dressed. That just doesn't happen. I hope not. So it says, can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. There's something wrong with our memories. So many hurts are burned into them so that they are hard to forget. Some people have many reoccurring bad dreams. And Christians can't seem to move on. Why? Because our flesh, our nature, loves to keep painful and dark memories, and it resists making new, better memories. It's part of the effect of sin on us, and it keeps most Christians trapped in their past. For the Christian, forgetting is something we're commanded to do, something we have to do on purpose, no matter how hard it may be for us, no matter what it might cost us. See, sometimes we hold on to a memory because it's power over someone who hurt us, constantly remind them of what they did to us, constantly rehearse in our mind what somebody did to us or what they didn't do or how they took advantage of us and we rehearse that and it gives us power and it's hard to let go because we lose power then but we have to forget it let me try and explain what it means to forget now i described this i show you this this poor woman she must be fairly strong to be at least holding that stone up that way but <clears throat> this is the life of most christians they are stuck there is a life ahead. There is, if she wanted to reach towards something ahead, can she reach toward it, yes or no? No, she cannot. She's putting all of her strength into holding that stone, and, and, and it, it, if she stopped resisting the pull of gravity, that stone's going to pull her all the way back down to the bottom. She doesn't want to start over again. So she's stuck there, would you agree? But there has to come a time when you look back at whatever is behind you and you've got to introduce some scissors. You've got to introduce something that would allow you to cut that 
and let it shift off to the back and let you go forward. Because I would say, out of all of Christianity, less than five, maybe two percent of Christians ever go forward. They get saved, they start in their Bible, they start going to church, but within a few weeks, months, maybe a few years, you find the majority of them falling away. And as we approach the end of days, the end of time here, Jesus says a great falling away is coming. And it's because our past is determining whether we are able to go forward or not. So to forget something means it's fairly simple, but you've got to see, first of all, you're Joe Soap here, and you have memories. You have things that have happened in your life. Maybe it's your failures. Maybe it's all the hurts and the, and the sorrows that just filled your life at certain periods of your, of, your, of your life. Maybe it was when you were a child. Maybe it was when you were a teenager. Maybe it was when you were a young adult. I don't know. But all of that just ties you back and holds you back so that you know you're saved. You're glad to be saved. You know one of these days... Jesus Christ is going to sweep down, pick you up, take you home to heaven, and you can't wait. But until that day, you're stuck. And you can't reach forward. You can't press forward because you're holding on to something and you're holding it because you're afraid of letting go. So there's four things you need to do if you're going to forget something. Number one, you need to walk on. It means to abandon whatever's in your past. It may be good but you need to abandon it. People constantly review and explore all their past pains. Sometimes they, they constantly are reviewing about how successful they are, and they end up staying in the past, never able to go forward. I don't know if you've ever had money fall out of your pocket, okay? It's a scary thing, okay? Maybe your wallet fell out of your pocket. <clears throat> um, if you ever do... If, if, money, if money ever fell out of your pocket, let's just pretend uh, I'm walking along and a 20 euro note falls out of my pocket and somebody says, oh, you dropped your 20. The normal thing is you stop what you're doing and you go back for it, don't you? But this is what happens. When God tries to take a memory, take a pain, take an event of your past and he tries to take it out of your memory and throw it on the ground, the devil comes along and says, you drop that, and you immediately go back, you go, oh yes, oh, I can't lose this, when it was God who wanted you to lose it. When, when you lose your keys, now some people are really smart, you see these guys, you ever seen these guys, and they've got, a, they got keys on a wire, you ever seen that thing? It was, you know, those are smart guys. Um, but uh, you ever, uh, uh, those wires are, are great for keys, but bad for memories. You do not need to have a line to every one of your memories and everything that happened in your past, because the more you stay attached to your past, the less you're able ever to be free to go forward in the future. People used to, you ever talk, you ever hear somebody says, I think she lost her marbles? You ever hear that phrase? Well, I'm not worried about losing marbles, not yet, but I am worried, I am, I am determined to lose some memories, because there's some things that we've got to lose, and it means that when, when the devil tries to remind you of something that hasn't happened in 10 years, what do you need to do? Walk on, because it is not your business now. I'll tell you more. Secondly, you starve your memories of attention. Um, Beth and Weston have two cats. Who is right. You know how to get rid of a cat? Starve them. They're smart. They will move on. Amen? Do not feed the cat. Now, Beth will kill him, but uh, <laughs> <clears throat> you know what your memories love? Attention. 
It's part of your, it's part of you. You whatever happened in the past was part of what made you you. But it's not what God wants you to be. God may have humbled, may have broken you, the devil may have stepped in and tried to destroy you. That's part of your past. But if you keep feeding that memory, if you keep going back to that time, if you keep coddling that memory and keep feeding it with your attention, you're neglecting what God has for you ahead. Starve memories of your attention. I don't mean that you don't have any memories. I'll tell you that in a minute. <clears throat> but all the stuff that happened to you in the past is nothing compared to what's going to happen in the future, folks. The life that, that, that Christ has for us now and in the future is better than anything you've had in the past. They used to say the good old days. You ever hear anybody talk like that, the good old days? Now, I don't know if they really were that good. I just know this. I'm looking forward to what God has for me in the future, and I'm never, I'm never going to be ready for it if I'm still living in the past. Third, if I'm going to forget something, I'm going to have to let them die. If you leave a memory of sorrow and failure behind you and you abandon it, it will die. It's wonderful. It's just, it's natural that we forget. Isn't that good? Isn't it good that sometimes you just, if, if you don't think, if you don't remind yourself of things, you forget. Is that not true? Now, there are some things you have to remind yourself of. There are things you have to make post-it notes and you have to put on the schedule. There are things that you have to remind. But when you don't keep reminding yourself of what happened in the past, if you are able to abandon it, walk on, and not giving it attention, naturally God designed us to forget. Amen. If you let it happen. You'll still have the memory. It'll still be there. It just won't have teeth. It won't have a grip on your life. <clears throat> You see, forgetting means there's nothing holding your thoughts to that memory. There's no anchor there anymore. No rope to the shore. No boat can go anywhere until the rope is cast off. And we're to cut our memories loose. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel 9. <clears throat> In your Old Testament there. 1 Samuel chapter 9. In verse 20. First Samuel chapter 9 and verse 20. Young Saul, this is Saul who later becomes king. First Samuel chapter 9 and verse 20. He's worried about his father's asses, his donkeys, because that was their livelihood. 1 Samuel 9.20. 1 <clears throat> Samuel 9.20. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, Samuel says to him, set not thy mind on them. Don't even think about them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel now? He said, not on thee and on thy father's house. Saul was told no longer to think about and worry about and focus on. He has spent three days searching for some, some lost cattle, and he's worried because that's their livelihood. If they, you know, it, it would be financial ruin. And as he's searching from, from uh, field to field and village to village, he runs into Samuel, and Samuel says, don't set your mind on it at all. Forget about him. Forget about them, because they are found in, in Saul. There's something better ahead. What was, what was ahead for Saul? He was about to be anointed king. And which was more important, donkeys or kingdom? The kingdom. So memories are supposed to be in the past. That's where they belong. And if you put them in the past, all of those ties to your memories can be broken so that you can now press forward. And this is what's missing in a lot of Christians' life. They're trying, they're, they, they're trying to, to, to hold on to something from the past, if not a lot of things, and they're still trying to do a little bit more for the Lord, and you just get worn out, and you give up this way, 
and you end up just holding on to some dead memories. Now, seven things that Paul had to forget, and I think you can relate to, if not some, all of them. Let me say this again. Paul did not forget his past. Go to Philippians. Go back to Philippians. His past was part of his life. As a matter of fact, when he would give his testimony, he would often go back through his past life. It wasn't like he ignored the fact that he was uh, a murderer and he was blasphemous. Uh, uh, he was lost. He never, he, he didn't ignore all that. But there were so many things he never remembered that it'll blow your mind. And it kept him sane. It kept him lighthearted kept him full of joy, even though he was in prison. So the seven things that Paul had to forget, number one, was his losses. Philippians chapter 3, if you look in verse 8, it says this, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath wherewith, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more, I could trust in my flesh, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, touching the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. Look at verse 7, but what things were gained to me, I counted all loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. Circle that word. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. What's the first thing that he had to forget about? It was everything it cost him to follow Christ. Now, hopefully, it hadn't cost you too much to become a Christian and to follow the Lord. Hopefully, you didn't have to uh, walk through a, a, a line of angry uh, people who are stoning you as you're trying to come into church. Hopefully, it's not so hard being a Christian today as it was with Paul, but for Paul to follow Christ, it, it cost him just about everything. He lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his nationality. You know, uh, to him, being a Hebrew of Hebrews was the top nation, and he said, I threw it away. I, I lost it. He was, he was the epitome of theologically correct. He says, I lost all my theology. I had to start all over when I got born again. He abandoned it all. It cost him. Secondly, he had to forget about his, his lumps. I like that word. Um, when I was a kid, I had a bully. His name was Clifford. And uh, Billy, uh, Clifford never said these things, this, but this is what was normally said when you got into a, f uh, a fight with a bully. The bully would say, come on, take your lumps. Did you ever hear that phrase? Just basically take the beating. And uh, Clifford never warned me, so I never could, could know that the lumps were coming. But anyway, but Paul had to forget the lumps. He forgot all about the the hurts that he had received from other people. Paul was rejected by the Christians at Damascus. That's got to hurt. When he had gotten saved on the road to Damascus, he arrives in Damascus. Nobody wanted anything to do with him. They actually pushed him out of the city. They almost threw him out of a window. They put him in a bread basket, uh, dropped him out, and says, Go away! <laughs> he, was, he was hurt by the Christians in Damascus. He was rejected. He ends up going down to Jerusalem, and the Jerusalem says, we don't want you here either, and they rejected him there. He, rejected, he was rejected by so many pastors in Philippi who were blaming Paul. Back there in chapter 2, Paul says, there are people who are, who are accusing me of being the blame while they're having a hard time preaching. He was constantly being blamed. How did he handle all those lumps? He forgot about it. He just forgot about them. He never forgot what he did to others. But what people did to him, he forgot about it. He was quick to forget what people did to him, and he was glad. As a matter of fact, he, he never asked God to, 
to judge those Christians up in Damascus. He never asked God to judge those Christians down in Jerusalem for rejecting him. He never asked God to judge those, those uh, um, pastors who didn't want to have any fellowship with him. You know what he said? I said, I'm glad Christ is preached. He, he was able to forget about it. The hurts by others hurt, but then he put them in the past. Do you have memories of hurts by other Christians? Do you have hurts by parents? Do you have hurts by neighbors and maybe even by churches? I don't know. Forget about it. He forgot his lumps. He also forgot his loneliness. I, I, I think Paul is, is a great example of teamwork. Everywhere he went, he always had people with him. He was always doing the, the work of the gospel with other men and with other people. Jesus, everywhere he went, there were people around him. They were ministering. They were working together as a team. That's how God gets things done. But there were times in Paul's ministry where there was nobody there. And you know what? You never find Paul ever saying, I want to quit because everybody's quit on me. I never find Paul complaining about it. One time he says, only Luke is with me. Everybody else has gone to different directions. But that's okay. There were times when he was alone in prison. There were times where he was alone on a sinking ship. The ship is sinking and Paul comes up to the top and he says, Hi, folks, I just had a great prayer meeting down, the Lord, down, down at the bottom of the ship. And Lord and I were having a great fellowship. You know what? It's going to be fine. Be of good cheer. And he was the only one that had that faith. Whenever you feel very alone in your home or in, in trying to do right, let me tell you, forget about it. You're doing it as unto the Lord. Paul had to forget his loneliness. This is important. I like this. He forgot about his limitations. You ever watch somebody who has a handicap? Race. Um, I think I told you the story. Uh, a boy had a dream to be in a marathon, but he had multiple sclerosis. And as he grew older, he became more feeble. And um, uh, his father used to push him with a wheelchair, wheel, with a wheelchair, on the racetracks. And when he came to the, the marathon, they wouldn't let him race with a wheelchair. So the father put his son on his back and carried him through that entire race so that son could experience a marathon. You know, that just blows my mind. Whatever limitation you and I have should not stop us from finishing. you got to forget about whatever limitation you think you've got and reach forth to whatever God has you to do and just do it and stay faithful at it and keep going at it. Another illustration was of a, a young man who was in a race, some sort of a race. Um, uh, it was an Olympic race, but um, whether it was a one mile or a, a whatever thing. And um, at the sound of the, the, the gun taken off, he started to run, and within a few steps, he tripped and he fell. And just the audience in the, in the, the stadium gasped. And he just, he shook it off, he stood up, he started to run, and he fell a second time. And if it had been anybody else, he would have, in shame, just walked off the racetrack. But he got up and he started to run that race, and as he began to go around that track and he began to catch up with them, he won. He won the race. And I like that. Because he could have said, I blew it. I fell not just once, I fell twice. But he determined, I'm going to press on. And I, I just, I'm, I, I'm just glad for examples like that because I need examples like that. Because if anybody's limited, we are. We don't know what we're doing in the Christian life. We don't know how to accomplish great things for God. We just want to see it happen. And the only way it ever happens is if we stay faithful, even though we fall, even though we're limited, even though we're weak. God told an 80-year-old bitter man to face Pharaoh down 
and to head out and, and to face his army and free Israel from Egypt's grip. Who was that? Moses. And he did it. God told a timid, self-centered, ill-tempered man to be king of Israel. What was his name? Saul. God moved a young 18-year-old to grab five stones and race out to a giant and bring him down with a slingshot. What was his name? David couldn't carry a sword in the battle. David had no shield. David had no armor. He was limited. But he says, I've got to face him. God told a barren old man and woman to have a bunch of children as the sand of the sea. Who was that? Limited. They were limited, and yet... They went ahead and believed God anyway. Paul had limitations. We all have limitations. We lack education. We lack refinement. Some of us struggle with health, mental problems, emotional problems, and we make too much of our limitations instead of the will of God. Forget about your limitations. How about his letdowns? And I like this part. Because I, weigh, I mess up way too much in life and ministry. And the devil would love to remind me of every one of my failures constantly. But I believe Paul failed a lot. You wouldn't believe it. There's a time when he was standing in front of uh, a Sanhedrin, a group of Pharisees and Sadducees, and uh, they were falsely accusing him, and he's standing up there, and the high priest sends a, a man to go down because Paul is just trying to be encouraged and trying to preach the gospel and tell them, I'm just standing here uh, believing the things that our fathers have, have believed. I believe in the resurrection. And out of nowhere, this guy comes up and with the back of his hand smacks Paul across the face. And Paul lost his cool. Paul looked back at the high priest. God's going to smite you, boy. <laughs> I mean, phew, just, he blew it. He and Barnabas had a falling out over John Mark. They split up. They, they, it was a bad argument there, and they both went in two different directions. Paul messed up, man. Paul later comes, and, and James tells him he needs to shave his head and uh, try to be Jewish again, and, and um, uh, try, to, try to get along with all the Jews and everything. And, and Paul blows it. He goes along with the program, and it aborts the will of God for his life and changes the whole direction there. Paul made some big mess-ups, is what I'm saying. But you never find him crushed by those mess-ups. Every one of those failures... In every one of those failures, Paul kept going. He kept serving. He kept preaching. He kept training men. He kept writing books. Thank God failure is not terminal for the Christian. As a matter of fact, I really don't believe any Christian fails unless they quit. That's the only time you ever fail. So when it comes to your long list of failures and failings, forget about it. Forget about your failures in, in, in trying. Well, I tried to teach. Well, I tried to soul win, and I ne nobody ever got saved. I, I, I tried being faithful to read my Bible, and I, I only get so far, and then I quit. You see, every one of those failures have defined you, and you're holding on to them instead of reaching forth into what God wants you to do. It's a new year. You ought to start reading your Bible all over again, right, Gavin? What was it like reading... In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Wasn't it awesome? He started all over in Genesis again on January 1st. Whatever letdowns, whatever failures you've experienced, forget about them. How about doubts? 2 Corinthians, go back to the left, find 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8. Second Corinthians 4, 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, 
but not in despair. You know what perplexed means? It means confused, uncertain, worried. Paul says, there are times I don't know what to do. But that's okay. He left them behind, and he just kept trusting. He just kept going. He just kept believing God. Look back in verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. I get there. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Talking about the treasure being faith in our lives, earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So even though we are troubled on every side, even though we are perplexed, verse 9, even though we are persecuted, even though we are cast down, it's okay. It's okay because I have, I have a treasure in the will of God and in the future. You and I need to leave behind in all the doubts and all the things the devil just brings up and says, are you really sure you're where you should be? Are you really sure you married the right person? Are you really sure that you're doing all that you should? I, at some point, you got to say, I have no idea. I just know this. I'm going to keep going. And if God changes my direction, let him change it. But until that day, I'm staying faithful. Even though I don't have full confidence, even though I don't know what I'm doing, I'm going to forget about my doubts. And lastly, he forgot about himself. Go to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 24. Matthew 16, 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Somebody once said, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is when you don't think of yourself at all. I think Paul, I think, if I could describe Paul, he was a hunched over, slightly disfigured, stammering, rude, long-winded preacher that the vast number of believers of this day would not like. He, he was not and is not viewed as a great and successful Christian like we think because half of what he writes, he is in prison. Of all the things that he's supposed to be so successful of, nobody seems to appreciate the methods he used. If you were to watch this guy, Joel Olstein and compare him to Paul, you'd say, Joel Olstein's successful, Paul is a failure. That's how people would think. But it never bothered him. Never bothered Paul that people didn't look up to him and didn't see him as great and successful. He had something to say. He had someone to win. He had another church to start. So there's one great thing about the Apostle Paul. He constantly forgot about himself. When you read Philippians, you think he's in a villa in southern Italy, riding on the breeze of the Mediterranean, coming wafting it over the veranda. And he's sucking down grapes. And he's got cheese. And, and he's... He's just relaxing as he writes, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We think Paul is having a great day when he writes that book, when he is not thinking of himself at all. He is in the middle of a prison. He is sitting in his own excrement. He is surrounded by vermin. He has people who are screaming in the, hall, in the halls and in the cells next to him, wanting to die. And Paul says, let's rejoice in the Lord. Because in the midst of all that, he forgot about himself. And he was able to press on. You and I have to forget the same things if we're going to press forward. All that to say this, next week I'm going to show you how to forget. Give you some ideas of what forgetting is, but that didn't tell you how to do it. God actually helps you forget. And it's priceless. Would you like to be able to not quit like so many others have these days? 
Wouldn't you like to be able to say, I ain't quitting. I'm actually going to stay the course. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to endure. Well, it begins with forgetting some things. And it is actually possible for a person to forget everything you've lost being a Christian. That's hard because most people, they're, they're, they're getting things all together in their life. They're, they're getting their image ready. They're trying to get their CV ready. They want to be able to go into a job and somebody be able to hire them and then start a career and make money and own property and get wealthy. That's how everybody lives. But let me tell you, when you do the will of God, you may lose everything. You need to forget about it. You're going to have to learn how to forget all the lumps that you endure. People, people will hurt you. Christians will hurt you. You're going to have to forget about it. The loneliness. Do you ever feel lonely as a Christian? I do. I wish there were a thousand people saved. I think of our young men, our young ladies, who need a husband, need a wife. I go, where are they going to find it? It's awfully, awfully quiet. It's awfully lonely around here sometimes. Forget about it. We didn't get saved to find a wife. We didn't, we didn't get Christ so that we can find a career. All the constant limitations. Just feel like you're hindered. All the failures. All the doubts and second guessings. Next time, pastor comes up and says, I need you to do this. Could you do this? Don't go, oh, I tried that before. and I do. Don't tell me that. Just say, sure, I'll give it another try. Amen. All the doubts, the second guessing. You finally forget yourself. You must learn to forget. But that only happens if you're born again, folks. Those, that'll only happen... Otherwise, it's impossible to, to forget those things. Those things will haunt you for the rest of your life. Too many people never get saved, and yet they try to read their Bible. They try to live the Christian life. They try to be good boys and girls. They try to, and they fail, and they just burn out, and they get angry, and they walk away, and they never come back. You're doing it wrong. You've got to get born again, folks. You got, it's hard enough being saved. Don't try to do it unsaved. You know what's wonderful about when you do get saved? God forgets. Listen to Hebrews 10, 17. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So if you want God to forget about your past and your limitations and your inability to live perfectly, if you want Him to forget about that, cry out to Him and ask Him to save you today. Because that's, that's the best forgetting. Father, I, this morning, ask you to make us keenly aware of the fact that there are things we need to forget. We're like warriors, remembering all the wrong things. And so we are stuck in all the wrong places. We live in the past. We let the hurts that happened maybe years ago still hurt us now. And so we've never moved forward. And we'll never will reach forth into the things that, are, that you've got for us ahead until we forget those things. They're part of our past. They're part of who we are, but they're not who we ought to be. And one of the great liberating truths of Christianity is we can forget. You designed us to forget those things. Help us, please. Free some people this morning, God. Don't let the devil tie us up and hold us back to things that don't matter now. Lord, you ha you're, you're the prize, and we're missing you. I pray not anymore. In Jesus' name, amen.